Today, I'm trying something new. This will be just a sort of roguelite spotlight for Spelunky. In all likelihood, this will be a two-parter accompanied by The Binding of Isaac. I felt like doing this because, in pretty much every review of any roguelike or roguelite, I end up mentioning these two games, at least briefly, numerous times. As I see it, they are two of the most influential games in the burgeoning world of roguelites, so I'd like to get into exactly what makes them so great and influential. I should mention first of all that this isn't going to be a sort of buyer's advice review, but something a little more in-depth. I mean, by all means, play Spelunky. Download the free version, play it, buy the remake, and play that too. But also know that this review will be full of spoilers for both. Not that Spelunky is an incredibly story-heavy game or anything, but this review may ruin the surprise of bosses and other encounters in the game. I'm not going to filter anything out. So the game of the day is Spelunky. You may or may not recall me saying in a previous video that Spelunky was the very first game that introduced me to the concepts of both roguelikes and roguelites. I wouldn't be here today doing this if somebody hadn't mistakenly called Spelunky a roguelike some eight years ago. And yes, again, I'm sticking to my guns and saying mistakenly. And if you want to know why, please watch my first video or two. Nobody ever really watches that second video. You know, they mostly just look at the first one, watch about 10 seconds of it, leave a comment telling me why I'm wrong, and that's the end of that. But yeah, watch those. So I got into Spelunky shortly after Cave Story, which is another of my all-time favorite games. It was probably the best free game I'd ever played at the time, and a handful of people told me I should try Spelunky because it's a similar game. In reality, I don't think the two games have a hell of a lot in common. They both play like retro platformers, but their styles are very different. Cave Story was not unlike numerous platformers I'd played in the past, such as Mega Man or Metroid. The main difference is that it's a bit less arcade-like in its difficulty, and more forgiving with the save points. Spelunky was a bit more like the relics of the arcade, in the sense that the game is fairly short, but packed with incredible difficulty so that you have to keep coming back, starting from square one, trying again and again, hoping to get just a little farther next time. Spelunky is so short, in fact, that you can beat it in a matter of minutes. My personal best is about seven, but it's likely to take you dozens, even hundreds of hours to see everything the game has to offer and master it. Now I know this review isn't about Cave Story, but, well, I'm going to be talking about it a good amount here. It makes for a good comparison to point out the dichotomy with Spelunky, and with the 2D platformers of past generations. In an old platformer like Ghosts and Goblins or any of the Mega Man games, each level was relatively long. Additionally, the levels were pretty difficult, and any presence of a save system was fairly cumbersome or unforgiving, even completely absent in the especially old games. These practices were relics of the arcade days, when game developers wanted their game to be difficult so that people had to spend more money to reach the end. For the same reason, they rarely wanted to implement any kind of save function or password system, because people will naturally end up spending more money if they're forced to start from the beginning every time. When games shifted more to home use than public establishments, developers slowly came to realize that there's no need to make their games incredibly difficult, because players had already shelled out the full price of the game, and the amount of money they spent couldn't possibly fluctuate based on the game's difficulty. And so the trend slowly came for games to have much more forgiving difficulty, and features like passwords or save functionality became standard. Enter games like Cave Story, made not only for home use, but entirely for free. You can say the game has a retro style, but it's in the art style and control scheme more than anything. The levels are still roughly the length of an old Nintendo game, but considerably less difficult, often featuring multiple save points in each level, so that death is never especially punishing. Now, observe Spelunky, which puts some unexpectedly ingenious twists on the game structure. And let's quickly note, I'm not saying Spelunky was the first game with this sort of formula. It may very well not be. I'm just reviewing my own personal trek through gaming history. In Spelunky, the high difficulty level and sparse saving capabilities are retained from the old days in favor of making the levels much shorter and more dense. Add into this mix random level layouts and a great deal of other random factors, and you have a game that's much more deep and rewarding than it appears on the surface. The dynamic of short levels with high difficulty is an appealing concept in its own right. Plenty of people love games in this style, as seen in the popularity of games like N or Super Meat Boy. 
However, and I can only speak for myself here, I tend to lose patience for those games before too long, because I grow to feel like I'm banging my head against the wall, trying over and over again to complete a fairly simple objective, which I know exactly how to perform, but I just can't get my thumbs to cooperate and make it happen. For my part, the addition of randomly generated environments and other random factors make for incredibly compelling gameplay. These were things I first saw in Diablo 2, and I was blown away by them. However, given how long it takes to complete a Diablo game or any of its clones, I've never felt like the randomly generated environments were especially critical to their appeal. Take Titan Quest for example. A game similar to the Diablo games, where I've clocked over 100 hours, completing multiple playthroughs, where none of the environments in the game are randomly generated. Again, this might just be me, but I think a game with a system to randomly generate levels is somewhat wasted on a game that's going to take dozens of hours to complete. The people who most benefit from this feature are those who are going to spend hundreds of hours going above and beyond a single playthrough, and really need that extra bit of freshness in each new round. The player who tries the game once, even if they play through the whole thing and defeat the final boss, isn't really going to be impacted much by this randomly generated world. An especially uninformed player might spend 20, even 40 hours on a game like this and not even know that the environments were randomly generated. It's in a short-term, difficult game like Spelunky, where these features play especially well. If the world in a game like Torchlight was entirely static, the game would still be very good and very compelling due to its length and otherwise deep well of content. But if Spelunky featured a static world, most players would likely get bored before they even get halfway to the final boss. And the players who get good would become equally bored after mastering the game because there would be nothing new to the game except trying to beat it as quickly as possible or under different challenging conditions. This is the stroke of genius present in Spelunky that so many roguelite developers have sought to mimic. There is enough content in the game that you probably won't even see most of it in a single playthrough. If you get an early game over, you can start fresh with a new level, one that will have different obstacles, perhaps fewer enemies, and perhaps some rare, incredibly helpful item that you never found before. This condition helps you to feel that each death was not entirely your own fault. If the game hadn't thrown so many enemies at you, you surely could have beaten it. If you find a weapon near the beginning again, you can totally reach some level that you've never seen before. What makes Spelunky consistently one of the genre-defining works in the roguelite world is that it strikes the right balance between the random factors and the difficulty. It's true that the environments can make you feel like the game gave you either an advantage or a disadvantage, but more often than not, you'll see that your deaths are a result of your own poor planning, or taking an unnecessary risk, or just miscalculating your jumps. Every item the game grants you, including the bombs and ropes that you start with, is a generosity. Most people don't realize this until they play the game for a considerable time, but each level is designed in such a way that no bombs or ropes are outright required to reach the end. Each level has a perfectly accessible exit. In fact, the entire game, including the final boss, can be beaten without picking up a single item. Well, 99% of the time. Sometimes you run into a fluke like this. Now, you might be able to make this claim of some other games in the roguelite world. I mean, you can reach the final boss in The Binding of Isaac without picking up any upgrades. The difference with that game is that doing so turns everything into a dull, slow-paced slog. But I'll talk more about that in another review. In my eyes, more would-be roguelites need to take a page from Spelunky in this regard. But in regards to this claim I've made of Spelunky, that it's entirely feasible to defeat the final boss without any special items, I feel like I should address the HD remake of Spelunky, and how it changes things. For the most part, the remake is a straight upgrade to the free version of Spelunky. There are new items, new enemies, new levels, local multiplayer, and generally so much more polish all around. I'm sure it helps that they broke away from Game Maker in that regard. However, in a lot of the new content, it's much more difficult to make that claim that all you need to survive is your whip, and no special equipment or extra bombs. It's still possible, of course, and those new levels are entirely avoidable, but all that extra content feels a bit less fair than all of the things that carry over from the original game. The new mini-bosses, in particular, feel much less clever than those from the original game. Furthermore, they can be far more difficult to avoid, like the alien queen aboard the mothership, who automatically attacks you once you enter a certain radius, and is unhindered by any kind of obstacle. Then there's Anubis, who appears without exception in the first temple stage, and will aggressively follow the player with insta-kill attacks. 
The second final boss is especially less clever than the original. Olmec was pretty much the perfect final boss for Spelunky to have because he was challenging but still fully beatable without a single item. Even the whip isn't absolutely necessary for his fight and has no effect on the boss itself. All you need to beat him is some clever movement. In fact, a player who encounters Olmec for the very first time may be able to discern how to beat him. The very act of avoiding his attacks is what teaches the player how to eventually defeat him. At first he appears to have no weakness, but just surviving the fight long enough will eventually make the solution obvious. I don't think I can overstate how perfectly designed this boss fight is. In nature, it even mimics the overarching structure of Spelunky itself. Just like in the game at large, it's possible to complete it without any extra items, but whatever you happen to have is sure to help. And just like the game at large, your success or failure is likely to be a result of how well you plan and approach ever-changing circumstances. In the rest of the game, it's about exploring each level and making the absolute most of your environment and resources. And in the Olmec fight, it's about really utilizing the space of the arena and making sure you don't end up burying yourself by poorly avoiding Olmec's attacks. I see King Yama, the new final boss of the HD version, as a considerable step back in terms of boss design. While Olmec feels perfectly natural to defeat without the aid of a single weapon, Yama feels more like it's just technically possible to defeat him without extra weapons. He isn't defeated under any special circumstances, like dumping Olmec into the lava, but is instead defeated just by dealing enough damage to him. In my most recent hell run, I didn't have any special weapons, and I quickly ran out of bombs, so the fight became a tedious process of repeatedly throwing one rock at him, over and over again. I don't know what I would have done without that rock, like if I had accidentally thrown it into the lava or something. Probably would have had to whip him to death. Just look how long this took. I'll speed the footage up as much as I can. Because he needs to be killed with just straight damage, the fight with him becomes a much less organic experience than the encounter with Olmec, and the preferred strategies become attacking him from a distance with sticky bombs or a gun. Olmec doesn't have many attacks in his repertoire, but everything he does makes sense, and is absolutely possible to deal with in a timely manner. King Yama's attacks are not as intuitive. A player encountering him for the first time may have no idea how to deal with, for example, the skulls he drops from the ceiling. A cutscene at the beginning of the fight reveals that he's able to do this, but a first-time player isn't necessarily going to know that this is his attack, and might think it's just an effect in the cutscene. A similar cutscene precedes Olmec, in which he kills a caveman by jumping onto him, clearly demonstrating to the player what is about to happen in the fight. But even without this introductory cutscene, it becomes pretty obvious that Olmec's MO is to approach the player and crush them. But nothing about King Yama's appearance gives the player an intuitive impression of his attacks. A player who sees him for the first time is not likely to say, obviously he's going to spawn magma men from his mouth, or obviously his head will start to float back and forth in the arena when he takes enough damage. And for all the extra effort it takes to reach the end of Hell versus the end of the Temple, this fight is much more likely to disappoint an unprepared player than the fight with Olmec would. Anyway, I'd better stop discussing these bosses so much so I can stop trying to reach them just to record this footage. I don't find these changes in game design to be especially detrimental to the remake, but it may just be where I'm coming from with it. I beat the free version of Spelunky 16 times before I ever picked up the HD remake. I even completed every extra challenge the game had to offer, and when the HD version hit Steam, I bought it right up and eventually got 100% of its achievements as well. If you want, you can even watch a video on my YouTube channel of me getting the good teamwork achievement all by myself. Shameless advertising. Please watch my other videos.
So as a big Spelunky enthusiast, the extra challenge in all the new levels and bosses was right up my alley. It didn't matter to me that some of the new content felt a bit less fair, because I had already put myself through far more challenge in the free version alone. Spelunky might be one of the pioneers of the roguelite genre, but it's interesting to note which elements of roguelikes it imitated. For years, they sported some heavy RPG elements. There was some randomly generated loot, items could be cursed or magical, they would often need to be identified, various deities were a big staple, random scrolls and potions whose functions you wouldn't know until you tried them for the first time, hunger mechanics. And these are things that you'll still often see popping up in the odd rogue light here and there, but it's important to take note of what Spelunky borrowed from the genre. The environments are randomly generated, and your character dies permanently at the end of your run. Imagine if Spelunky had retained a few more aspects of the genre. What if all the weapons you found could have random positive or negative attributes? What if there were potions that could give you random buffs or debuffs? What if there were multiple deities whose favor you could earn or lose instead of just the one? As influential as Spelunky would be on the future of the genre, might these game elements also have become definitive features in the roguelite world? And suppose that Spelunky had not featured those randomly generated environments, but instead featured entirely static levels. Or imagine that the game started you with 32 health instead of 4, or that each death just caused you to revert to your last save point. Would Spelunky, and by extension the roguelite genre, have found anywhere near the level of success they hold today? These are the biggest features that made Spelunky what it is. The randomly generated environments, and the high difficulty combined with short levels, permadeath being one aspect of that difficulty. But keep an eye out for a future review, where I'll discuss how The Binding of Isaac built onto that model, and helped define the roguelite genre as it is today. Thanks for watching another review, everyone. While I've got your attention, have a look through the rest of my reviews. Also, check out some fun Let's Play type stuff that I do with my friends. I have a lot of fun making all these videos, so I hope you have fun watching them.